All right. Who has the mic? Tom. Uh, first of all, um, this has been a phenomenal uh, weekend and deeply appreciated. I wanted to, yeah, really. I, I wanted to um, riff on a few topics that we touched upon yesterday and today. Uh, I can't disagree at all that a lot of positive things have happened. Um, uh, if, if we rolled the clock back 400, 500 years, probably everyone in the room here would be burned at the stake for blasphemy. <laughs> so, so I wanted to follow up on the uh, sort of the religious thread. Do you think that um, in some sense, the, you mentioned the high priest of science, um, the priests of our time in some sense, uh, by some have been uh, scientists. A lot of people have, uh, you know, generated beliefs in science leading us out of a lot of the ignorance that we had during the dark ages, mm -hmm. and, and that, that was a very positive thing, uh, because they were burning people then. Uh, and uh, do you think that um, it has become somewhat dogmatic, I think, uh, these days, in terms of the final frontier, which to me is consciousness as primary or consciousness emergent from matter? Uh, you know, the idealist paradigm versus the realist paradigm. Do you believe that, um, Science, in some sense, uh, is and has is somewhat analogous to uh, the dogmas that have been founded in religion. Um, maybe you could talk to our way out of this uh, yeah. in the future. <clears throat> yeah, I do think that there's that's a pretty good analogy. You know, there was a there was a watershed uh, moment in the early 1920s, right after the Devil's Slit. The people who had done the double slit, you know, that whole bunch of, you know, Schrodinger and Planck and Bohr and Einstein, and there's this whole bunch of physicists who saw this as, wow, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. We've got something here that is so different than what we expected that it's going to enlighten us to a whole new way of thinking and a whole new science. And that was the field. People were excited about it. It was a big discovery and a big thing, but they couldn't explain it. They had no explanation, not even a, they didn't even have any conjecture. You know? They found a way to compute to get a right answer, and that is with an assumption that the particles weren't particles, but they were probability. And then you look at the probability all over and you do the integration you know, over all the probability space and you end up with a, with a result. And they talked about the wave function collapsing to a physical particle. But they didn't really know what that meant. And people talked about, well, the particle interferes with itself. But they didn't really know what that meant. These are all just metaphors. The wave function doesn't collapse to a particle like you have this wave function and suddenly it collapses and a particle appears. It's not like that. There is no physical wave function. The wave function is just a mathematical concept. It's a piece of logic. Uh, so we had words like, oh, the particle goes through both slits and interferes with itself. Another metaphor as far as reality goes, obviously, that's nonsense. That doesn't happen. We're talking about a particle. So they, they tried everything they could think of. It was all wild conjecture, and none of it went anywhere. There was no theory. There was no understanding. And that excitement died with time. And pretty soon, it was embarrassing to the point that the new way of dealing with that discomfort was to say, well, it's just weird science and nobody will ever know. It's one of those things that are impossible to know. Nature is just gonna keep this secret forever. Well, what that said was, don't blame me. It's not my fault that there isn't any answer. It's impossible to know. So that took the blame off of the scientists who were supposed to figure out what was going on and they claimed impossibility rather than fallibility on their own part. And since that time, there's been this, this need to justify the double slit and everything else in terms of a materialistic,
paradigm. Because that they did understand. It's like that was the last time they thought they understood what they were doing, was with materializing things and Newton. And since nothing else has turned up, their idea was then that materialism must be it. And we just don't understand how this double slit is actually a material thing. And they've tried all sorts of ways to justify that and failed. It just doesn't work well as a materialist thing. So I think they kind of retrenched and retrenched as this thing went on to the point that they were in denial almost that it even existed and didn't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> and they've gotten to the point that materialism is right, period, and anything other than that is wrong, period even though they've had a hundred years now of quantum physics telling them that materialism really isn't right. Material particles don't rearrange themselves with no forces acting on them into diffraction patterns for no reason. But it happens anyway. So I think they get a little defensive about it. So yes, they back themselves into a corner to the point that, you know, philosophy tells you that there's you know, there's, there's two basic fundamental positions you can take about reality. And these have been fought over since Plato. Plato's uh, shadow on the cave wall. You know, he was the idealist. There's some other world, you know, the shadow world. That's what he was saying. He, that was his allegory to our physical world is the shadow world. And there's some other world behind that, some other superset behind that and all we see is the shadows. Those were the idealists. And then there were the realists that say, no, what you see is what you get, and there's nothing else. And that argument has been raging through philosophy and somewhat through science for millennia. And, you know, it, it kind of came to a peak, I guess, and, in, in, uh, you know, we had uh, a whole list of of uh, English and French and German philosophers, the last big gun of that was Kant, who were idealists. But then there was the science that was blossoming at the same time that were the realists. The realists seemed to make a lot of really nifty gadgets. You know. So they won favor with the general population because the realists did their science and did their engineering and out popped toasters and dishwashers and you know, all kinds of nifty things that we didn't have before. And it became recognized that it was the scientists who really knew what was going on and everybody else was faking it or just making it up or was confused. And that's when the scientists got the role as the new high priests of Western culture. The high priest's job is to tell everybody else what to believe. That's what the high priests do. Believe this, this is the truth. Well, we look to the scientists to tell us that. Is that true or not? I don't know. Ask science. What does science say? Science only tells the truth. Science does experiments and they tell you what the truth is and that's the end of it. If you disagree with science, you're wrong. So scientists are the new high priests, and yet they're very biased in their belief in materialism. So these two opposite points are that if you're a materialist here in this, this point, on this corner, you have materialism. If you're a materialist, you also have to be a determinist. Materialism requires determinism. Materialism says it's a material world, it's just a big machine. Well, machines are deterministic. A physicist will say, if you give me a particle and tell me everything about it, you know, its velocity, its position, its spin, its this, its that, everything about it, and everything about its environment, I can predict as far in the future as you want of where it's gonna be and what it's gonna do. If I know, if I had all the information, I could predict the future perfectly because it's all just a machine, okay? So a materialist has to be a determinist. Materialism and determinism 
denies, has to deny, logically, has to deny that there are such things as free will. Because if you're a determinist, there's no free will. Everything just happens. Free will is an illusion. That there's no such thing as time, because with time you have change. And if everything's determined, things don't just change. They're, you know, they work because they have to work that way. And there is no consciousness. So free will, time, and consciousness have to be illusions. And they misinterpret some relativity equations that say that, oh, look, time, the past, the present, and the future all coexist at the same time. It just depends on your point of view. Nonsense. That's a misinterpretation. You know, if you look at it, a mathematician will tell you there's a big difference between physics and mathematics. And physics is mostly mathematics. It's applied math, except in math, you need logical proofs. And if you don't have the proof, it's not important. Forget it. In physics, you get to make things up called interpretations. Here's what the equations mean. You know, they mean this, this, and this. Well, the equations don't actually mean anything. They're just a logical statement of this logic stream, whether it's right or wrong, that's all they are. But physicists make up interpretations of things. And, you know, often they're not right. Just, they just, it's convenient at the time for the interpretations. When I was in, in uh, undergraduate school, that's one of the things Professor cautioned us about. Don't believe all this stuff you hear. It's just an interpretation. That's what we think is probably the answer, but don't take that too seriously. Well, that was good advice. So anyway, so we have equations in relativity that you can misinterpret to be that there is no time. So if there's no time, then there can't be change. If there's no change, then there's no, you know, there's no choice. Choice is before the choice and after the choice. That's change. Choice requires time, before and after. Time, choice, and consciousness all go together. Consciousness, because consciousness makes choices. Consciousness evolves, that's time, that's change. Okay. If you don't have time, then you can't have change. Change is, a, is an expression of time, before and after, you see? So we're stuck in these two intellectually and, and philosophically and logically opposite corners with consciousness, free will, free will's a choice. Okay. If it's deterministic, there are no choices. There are no choices, there is no free will. So consciousness, free will, time. They all are necessary for each other. You can't have one without the other two. You can't have consciousness without choice. You can't have choice without free will. You see, they just all go together. Down here, you can't have determinism without materialism or materialism without determinism. So these are just opposite. The, it's unfortunate, and I guess in a way it's, it's, it's uh, very telling that the scientists who wanted materialism end up with determinism and un end up saying something that is so silly and so counterintuitive as to say, there is no consciousness. Yeah, well, who's making that statement? There is no consciousness. There is no time, which means there is no past, there is no future, there is no, you know, yet here we are, things are happening. There is no free will, yet all of us make choices. You didn't end up sitting in this seat because some force outside of you, you know, brought you here against your will and set you down. You made choices that ended you up here, and you made thousands of choices, you know, before that that ended you up here. So the fact that you have free will, choice, and time is so intuitively obvious to everybody who has experience that I would think the scientists would have to blush a little when they say free will consciousness and time are all illusions. It's like, really? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all. You have to, you know, you have to be in one or the other of these. You can't say 
Well, free will's good, and, and uh, time is good, but I don't really don't like consciousness. Or you can't say time and free will's good, but so is materialism. I'm a materialist, but I also think that consciousness is a good thing. You can say that, but it's illogical. Those two are mutually exclusive. So you're either materialist and a determinist, and free will, consciousness, and time don't exist. Just delusions. Or free will, consciousness, and time do exist, and determinism and materialism is an illusion. Okay. It just looks like this is a material world. It just appears like it's a material world, but it's really an illusion. It just looks like there's determinism because we can, you know, I can, I can see a picture of who it is I'm going to marry and, you know, 15 years later I find that person and marry him. Oh, it must be deterministic. Well, it just appears to be deterministic. But you can't mix and match between those two. So the scientists have ended down here in this ridiculous corner of no time, no consciousness, no free will, and materialism, which their own experiments say doesn't exist. And they don't know how to get out of it. Because just like in the, after the 20s and the 30s and 40s, there's no explanation. They have no theory. They have nothing to explain how to get out of that, that corner. So they're very biased. They're, uh, that's, that's physics dogma. And it's just a belief. And they've painted themselves like all beliefs. When you have a belief, you're no longer open to other ideas. And that's why we had such a hard time finding a group of physicists who would do these experiments. They didn't want to go there. That's not a place they feel comfortable even exploring. It's like, I don't want to know. No, 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 no. You know, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You know, it's that sort of thing. They just don't want to go there. So it's unfortunate, but that will change. I mean, we've seen that before in science and other things where the, the, the conventional wisdom proves out to be the opposite of what's actually true. So I think that will happen here too. And an interesting comment that Planck made, a direct quote from him, is that physics will change one funeral at a time. That's a quote unquote from Max Planck. And that's because he was getting a lot of blowback from, from other scientists about how outrageous and stupid quantum mechanics was. But there it was in front of him, he couldn't deny it. So he got a lot of grief because of that. And that'll happen here. Virtual reality becoming a thing in our culture over the next couple of decades. Uh, a younger group of physicists moving in. Uh, it's already being accepted in a lot of physics departments that virtual reality is a, is a thing worth thinking about. So it's coming. It won't be that long, but yeah. So. This materialism has become like religion to, to science. But they are the high priests. And as far as you know, my thought is that until the high priests tell everybody else that virtual reality is the truth or is the right thing, then it'll stay in the margins. That's where spiritualism and, and uh, you know, Big picture concepts have always been relegated to the margins. They can't get into the mainstream. No idea can get into the mainstream until the high priests bless it. It's the function of the high priests. But after the high priests bless it, I expect it to spread like wildfire because it has a solution and an answer that people have been waiting for for a long time. It suddenly sets them free from dogma, scientific dogma, religious dogma, it gives them answers of who am I, why am I here, what's the point, why is it like this, and uh, how can we make it better, what do we need to do. So all those answers start to fall out of this virtual reality thing. And I think people are ready for those kinds of differences. We've kind of hit the wall here and aren't uh, finding a lot of improvement. So I think that's, you know, that's kind of the idea. So that's why I say physicists are going to be at the core 
of getting this ball rolling into the future of a kinder, gentler place. They're not going to intend to. That'll be the last thing from their mind. They'd be horrified to know that they were going to be the ones that started like a social revolution. That's not what scientists do, but I think they're going to do it and won't be able to call it back. Funny if engineering gets us out of that place, huh? Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's engineering so far that hasn't been stuck in, in a belief system. And it's basically the engineers couldn't care less about who believes what about anything. Let's build the thing, plug it in, and see if it works. I mean, it's simple, guys. It either works or it doesn't work. And exactly why it works? Eh, okay, maybe some physicists will figure that out and tell me, but that's not really what's important. What's important is knowing that it works and how, what we can do. What can we build with it? You know, what good is it? What's it good for? That's the, that's the way engineers think. They don't think in terms of, well, is that politically correct? You know, is, is that, uh, does that match up with our dogma? And if not, we can't work on it? Yeah, that's a religious attitude. Yeah, Joe's a physicist, too, yes. so he, he, don't he understands. That, don't hold that against me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, the group that ended up creating that paper yeah. is a group that, the paper that, that uh, was published about virtual reality that, that uh, really st started a lot of this was, was uh, they're all here. Yeah. There's Joe, there's Human, there's Bob, and David. Yeah. All, of, all of those names are on that paper. And we all got together after 2016 here outside of LA and uh, I gave a talk about these experiments. We all got together after and said, you know, we got to figure a way to get this done. And that was the beginning of it and Human being a Caltech guy has, and one who published papers, that's his job as a professor, right? He publishes papers. So he had all the software and the equipment for making those very, very hard formats that the physics journals, and you know, the little columns that are only that wide and all the math and other stuff in there. So Human had that under control. And if it wouldn't have been for him, it would have taken us 10 times longer to do this paper because the format is a killer if you don't have the inside track on how to do that. So he wrote it up, put it all into the right form. And uh, uh, Joe here uh, came up with uh, lists of, of uh, supplies and things that we needed to do the experiments. And Bob and Dave were there cheering us on and, and having discussions and helping us see what sounded reasonable, what way to go, how can we do this, so that you know, it'll work. There's various paths we can take, we can raise money, we can do this, we can do that. So they were, they were helping us figure out how we were going to move this thing forward. And now here it is, 2016 to 2019, and we got Cal Poly back here. With, he's on board and we're going to find out, so stuff is happening. But it was pretty much between you know, those four guys and myself got together at the end of the program in 2016 and decided to make it happen. Yeah. Howman gave a new uh, meaning to Howman being. He's a he, real Howman being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now Bob, sitting in the middle back there, he was the one that orchestrated, came up with the idea, managed and orchestrated the whole uh, uh, crowdfunding idea around Kickstarter. He put that whole thing together and got it going and because uh, he did that, we ended up with a couple of hundred thousand dollars to deal with, you know, so we could uh, pay Furbot here to, to uh, do the work. And to make a good documentary at the end, because doing some great science is wonderful, but if nobody knows about it, it doesn't make much of an impact. It doesn't change anything. So we want to have a really good documentary movie made that hopefully will be of a quality that somebody like Netflix would pick it up and distribute it so that millions of people will get this idea of a bigger picture. 
and get this idea of a kinder, gentler place. And how does this physics relate to, you know, love and caring and that sort of thing? And if we can make that into a documentary that, see, that is seen by millions of people, then we're much closer to this world making that turn toward a kinder, gentler place. So that's kind of the plan of where we're, of where we're going. So we're, we've got to start now. So the, the, the groups, the groups here, we were just all taking a picture together then, but. Uh, well, who's next on the mic? Hold on just a second. Has a question. I'm going to give him the mic. Is that OK? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Okay. okay, go for it. So, what is the um, connection between the mind of the system, the mind of the player, and the mind of the avatar? It is not just a rendering uh, engine, right? Because it's, there's a sequence of constraints or constrictions that, that go through the rendering that constrain the mind of the avatar and the mind of the player. For instance, when you when you eat that sugar, that sugar is not real. If you use the VR metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. But your mind is still constrained. Yes. It's constrained by what? The system? Right. The it's avatar? It's constrained by the rule set. Now, let me, let me tell you. I see your question. Let me give you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> what happens is that the, this virtual reality has evolved from a rule set and initial conditions. The rule set defines all the energy transfers, all the interactions that are possible, okay? And it evolves under that and evolves to be what it is, okay? So the avatar has no mind. The avatar is just a calculation. It doesn't really exist anywhere. It's just a calculation in a computer. The avatar really has no brain unless you open up a skull and then you have to put something in there so there's a brain. So that avatar though represents the rule set because it evolved in this simulation with that, with that rule set. So that avatar is what it is, works the way it works, has the biology it has because that's what evolved under this rule set. So when you go in and change something, like eat sugar or get bashed over the head with an iron pipe, all right, now you've done damage to the avatar. And the rule set says that when you get hit with that iron pipe, or let's say you eat that sugar, the biochemistry rule set is unbalanced, or there's a part of the brain that's damaged, and that creates constraints according to the rule set. Because the rule set says, and unless you have this brain and it's all functioning well and you're, you know, crisscrossing between the, the hemispheres and all that's going on, the rule set says that enables what the conscious is doing to do it. So I thump it with an iron bar and now it's got a big crease in it and the avatar slurs its speech, drags a foot, can't remember anything. The consciousness now is constrained to work with an avatar that slurs its speech, drags its foot, and can't remember anything. So that just put a constraint on what the conscience can do with that avatar, and the constraint is defined by the rule set, which defines what are the constraints when you get hit on the head with an iron pipe at exactly this place with so much force. So it's, it's just the rule set. That connection between the avatar, what happens to the avatar, and what the conscience can do is the rule set computes that. So the rule set can compute constraints. It can lessen constraints and it can increase constraints based on what the rule set says about biology. So if you eat that sugar, you get your brain fog and you go out of your body, do you carry your brain fog with you? Uh, what, yes, you do. Your, your brain fog doesn't change consciousness. So when you say you take it with you, your brain fog doesn't fog consciousness, what it does is it makes consciousness, what consciousness can do with the avatar, foggy. So now consciousness can only get so much out of that avatar. So the consciousness is, yes, if your little free will awareness unit is in the fog as well, because this, it only experiences what the avatar can experience according to the rule set. So the avatar now experiences fog. 
It doesn't know, it can't think very well, it's, it turns into a zombie. It doesn't think well. And then as the sugar goes away, the, the, the free will awareness unit can process better. But it's not that it's affecting consciousness, it's affecting what consciousness can, how consciousness can make choices with the avatar. So, so yes, the free will awareness unit is unable to make choices that it otherwise maybe would make clearly and quickly. Now it's kind of stumbling around because it's got brain fog. So, so let's say you, 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 you do something dramatic, like you cut that brain in half. You know, you do a dissection, and they've done this with people who have very severe epilepsy. You just cut the corpus callosum right down and separate the halves. And now you've got two halves of the brain that can no longer communicate. And, you know, different parts, you basically end up with like two separate brains, in a sense. Because, let's say, this left eye, it sees things, and that sight goes into the right part of the brain. Okay. So if I have this person and I've cut their brain in half and I have a board here so the eyes are separate and I hold something up in front of this eye, then this right part of the brain is what gets that picture. And because the right part of the brain is um, the part that is, let's say, can draw pictures, is the artist part, then that person can draw a picture of that. But if you ask them to describe it, what was that that you just saw? They can't tell you. I have no idea. I so, don't know. Can you draw a picture of it? Sure. Draw a picture of it. But what is it? Tell me what it looks like. I don't know. I can't do that. Because it's the left side of the brain that does language. The language part didn't get the message because the corpus callosum isn't sharing information anymore across the hemispheres. You see? So these kind of experiments uh, were done in the 50s. But so it's just because that's the way the rule set works that you uh, get these, these odd things. It's the rule set's biology, it's the rule set's physics, the rule set's chemistry. In your book, you describe a way to go beyond the rule set when you meditate. For instance, you say that when you were a student, you were writing lines and lines of code, and then you had a bug in, the, in, those, mm -hmm. in this code. But you go through your meditation, and then in, you could identify the location of the bug Yes. right away. Are you accessing a part of the player that is not constrained when you do that? Can right. you access the mind of the player? Can you access the mind of the system? That's essentially my question. Can you get a? Can you see the real reality not through your own perspective, but through the perspective the of through the broader perspective of the, of the player, or the broader perspective of the system? Well, perspective is how you interpret it, right? Your perspective is how you interpret the data. So with who you know, and you, and your your perspective is limited to what your background is, to what yeah. to what you understand. So if I go out of body or if I go someplace else or if I'm getting data like that, I have to interpret it in terms of my own background, in terms of what I know, in terms of my own beliefs and fears and the rest of it. So I'm limited to my perspective, or the perspective of the free will awareness unit. Okay, so now I can go out and see things out there and get data streams that are not from this reality but I have to assess those data streams in terms of what I know and what my experience is, which is all my experience that I have here. In the beginning, eventually you start getting not only experience here, but experience there. And then you can start assessing things based on the experience you've developed in the non-physical, which gives you a whole broader range of, of, of point of view. But initially you're stuck just with what you've with what you've experienced here. So when I did that, I was getting data out of the database. The system gave me data. I think it was a wake-up call for me. You know, the system just gave me this data out of the database and uh, to help open my eyes to a larger reality. So that's what, you know, so they just stuck that in my database. It was, 
I had the, in, I had the uh, intuition to do it and it worked. Surprisingly enough, I was the most surprised person involved. Thank you. David, is this in relationship yes, to this? Okay, yeah, there's a follow up, so hold on. So this is a follow up on the first part of uh, what Human was asking about is if uh, the, the player goes out of body, is out of this reality frame, mm -hmm. are they free of the constraints of the avatar then? In other words, it, the, the most adept out of body person I ever met was in, incredibly good at it and all he wanted to do was teach others to do it and he was the world's worst teacher. And it was because he wasn't real bright and he said to me, you know, I, when I go out, I know so many secrets of the universe, I know everything and when I come back in my body, I'm an idiot again. No. Is no. no, it's not like that. I mean, it was like that for him, but okay. the reason that it was like that for him is that he didn't have any context with which to bring it back and explain it. It's not that he was an idiot, but he didn't have any model to explain it. He didn't really see what was going on there. If he did, then he would have been able to explain it here. So you understand, you see things telepathically, you get the information, it all makes sense. But then when he came back, he didn't have a structure to you know, to put it on, it's sort of like the physicists. They didn't have any structure to hang quantum mechanics on, so they were stuck. It seemed impossible. There was just nothing intelligent they could say about it. Yet there was a structure. They just didn't. They just didn't see it. So it's not so much like that. When, when you go out of body, you will interpret things as you would interpret things here. And as you have a greater understanding of the nature of reality, you get a greater in breadth in your interpretation. Yeah. Is there, um, the player is the uh, uh, free will awareness unit, yeah. and, and the IOUC uh, that it's part of, then that's not constrained then by uh, the limitations of the free will, free will, free will awareness unit. Okay. In other words, is it sort of off what Human was saying? Is, can you access what's above you that has a bigger picture? To see it from that bigger picture? Yeah. Uh, no, I think I know what you're saying, and I'd say no. That partition goes between you, free will awareness unit, and the IUOC, and you're just the free will awareness unit, and you interpret everything in terms of, of what you understand. So Why you would there be that? And, you, don't, you don't go in and suddenly have the perspective of the IUOC or the perspective of something else. What you are and your experience is that free will awareness unit. Now, once you die, that, that partition comes down you start to, it starts to just fall apart and comes down and it all gets integrated again and now you are the IUOC again, no partition. And it's the IUOC that does the negotiation for what are we going to do next because it has the insight into all the various, uh, you know, experiences you've already had and it can look at that collective and see trends or problems or whatever else. So at that point you're the IUOC and then when you decide to go back, another partition is made another free will awareness unit and it attaches to that avatar. So there's no possibility of penetrating that partition until you're dead? No. Okay. No. Yeah, only after you die does that partition come down. So you're kind of stuck in that space. Hi. Um, that kind of has a little bit to do with my question. Um, You've, t you've mentioned, um, you know, that we're at seven and a half billion people on this earth now. Um, how were each of the IUOCs for those 
uh, people like developed if, you know, as we, you were talking about in tribal societies, we had like, you know, we started out with 10,000 homo sapiens. So were they created or were they broken off from the LCS? And then also after we die, as you talked about, you become the IUOC again, is that still individual or are we kind of, does that kind of blend into the LCS? And then secondly, after that, um, what are your thoughts on the Kashuk record? And if that exists, does it contain everything that was and also that will be? Because you're talking about free will, but like this gentleman was talking about a v dream, a pre premonition he had about the future. Mm -hmm. So was that already predetermined and written in the Kashuk record? Okay. Let's, let's start at the end and then work backwards. Okay. Okay. So the last ones with the Akashic records. Yes, the Akashic records are a real thing. And I don't say that because I thought it's a good idea or because the Hindus thought it was a good idea. I say that because it is necessary for the logical model of consciousness. The way the conscious system works is that anything new that comes into the consciousness, any new measurement, new piece of information comes in. Okay. If there is uncertainty about it, you know, it could be this, could be that, we don't know, we're going to take a measurement. What you get is a random draw from a probability distribution of the possibilities. That's what comes out. Okay. For example, scientist looks in the sky with a big telescope that looks further than anybody else. Nobody's seen what's there before, so it's new. Okay. He looks through the scope, and what he sees is a random draw from a probability distribution of the possibilities. And that's what the rendering engine sends him. That's reality. Now, once that's here, it stays here. Anybody else looks, they'll see the same thing. Now, the system has some constraints, what it can show him. All those possibilities are constrained by the fact it has to not be out of, you know, it has to be in consonance with history, you know, with everything before. Like, what else we know is in outer space? It's not going to be something dramatically different. It has to match up with what's around it. And two, the rule set. It can't be something that violates the rule set. So you have those two conditions, but within those conditions, there's 10,000 things that he might see. One that gets picked. So because it's a, that random draw from the probability distribution means the things that are most likely are most likely to get pulled out. But it can pull out something that's kind of a little off the wall, something that's maybe even one in a million. Can pull out strange stuff, but it mostly doesn't. So, so that's how that gets done. And that's the same with us. Everything that we do here, when we make a measurement, when we come up with something that's unknown, that's how the system tells what it is unknown it's going to show us. It's a virtual reality. It has to render something. That's how it figures that out. Well, in order to do that, it needs a database of all the things that are likely to happen and the probability that they might, because that's the input data it needs to that, that, uh, you know, that random draw. It needs that information. So it does that. It calculates that. It calculates a future probable database. Everything that could happen and the probability that it will. And it just calculates that on out through time. And that's the future probable database. It's just probability. It's not what will happen. It's everything that could happen and the probability that it will. Remember I talked about you can change future probability with your intent. That's the future probability that you're changing with your intent. It makes things more or less likely to happen. So it has all that data, so when a new measurement's taken, like you open uh, your refrigerator door after you've been away for three months and you don't remember what's inside there, something has to be drawn in there because you know you left something in there. You just don't know what it was. Well, you get a random draw from that distribution and that's what's in there. Okay. So it, it happens everywhere. It's not just for outer space and deep in the sea. It's all of life works that way. You dig a hole in your backyard. Well. You're going to find a gold doubloon, or you're going to find a dinosaur bone, or you're just going to find an old rock and a lot of dirt. Random draw from a probability distribution. So it needs all that to constantly be deciding what to render. So it has that database. Now as time goes on, 
that probable future database starts going into the present and to the past. And eventually you have this big past database that is everything that could have happened but didn't and a history thread of what actually did happen, what we chose to happen. And you have all the possibilities. And that database of the probable future, everything that could happen and probably that will, and everything that did happen, plus the probability of everything that might have happened but didn't, you know, all those things, and it's probability. That taken all together is the Akashic Records. And anybody in the past, past millennia, who have explored inner space, if they explored it thoroughly, they would have run across this database. It's just information available. And you, you query it with your intent. So that it's necessary as a function of the rendering of the virtual reality. So that's what the Akashic Records are. It's there. Um, you can get into that database and explore it. You can go look at past lives. You can look at probable futures. You can explore that database in a couple of ways. You can get graphs. You get to, you get to tell the system what kind of output you want. I want this output and you know five color chart with these kinds of things. That's what you'll get when when. Uh, Psychics look at auras and read auras, they can data out of the database. And typically the way they get that data is just the default definition because the default was defined by the people who made color, color drawings of it, like Man Visible and Invisible by Ledbetter. So he's got all these color drawings, everybody reads the books and everybody interprets the same way, but if you want to change the color scheme around, you can change it around and get it in those colors. It really doesn't have anything to do with the person. I mean, it has something to do with them, but there's not something physical there that is that person. You can see an aura just as well in a photograph or just as well in your mind without a photograph or a person, either one. All you need is an intent. Okay, so that's the... Akashic records. Um, what was, take the next one back. Um, the, our IUOCs, how did we get seven point seven and a half billion from okay. 10,000? How do you make new IUOCs? Where yeah. do they come from? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when you, when the population goes up, you need another player because you've got another seat in the simulation. The way that the player has gotten is there's several ways, but one, it's just, it's made up, it's created. Okay, what they do is you take an average player, just the typical player, where they are in their, in their development. Take that and copy, paste, 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 for as many of them as you want. Now, because you don't want them all to be the same, you don't want a whole bunch of identical beings came because you just did paste, paste, paste you have some little algorithms that you use to mix up some of their attributes. Okay, already you know that their quality is about the same as average, but you got other attributes that you come in with that you might want to change up. And there's a couple of ways that you could do that. It would be nice to have an algorithm that was triggered to the virtual reality itself. That would be kind of nice. And maybe as an example, like it could have something to do with the place and the time that somebody was born. Those characteristics might say, well, if they're born in this place, you know, longitude, latitude at this time, then we'll put those variables in and we'll run a little random numbers and out pops one set of characteristics. So that would might be one way to do it. And there may be other ways that just have, well, here's, you know, that would be like uh, astrology, right? There's other ways like uh, the 16, the four by four matrix that, it, that you get out of Myers-Briggs, it may just say, well, here's 16 different things. All right, I need all these new players. I'm just gonna go in and randomly select through these things out of these buckets. I got 16 buckets. And I'm gonna kind of pull out with some randomness around it so every bucket doesn't have exact, you know, every draw out of the same bucket doesn't have exactly the same stuff. It just has similar stuff. And I'll randomly apply it to people or I'll apply this one in 10% and that one in 
because it wants diversity. Diversity is wonderful. Diversity helps us all grow up. Sameness is boring. Not only boring, but it, it, it reduces choices. Diversity increases choices. You want as much diversity as possible. So this would make sure that all the IOCs were diverse and kind of unique in their own ways before you start. So it's mainly a, a copy out of the average and then a little fuzz added around the edges as far as attributes go to make it unique so that they're all not the same. And then that player just, you know, now you've got a new IUOC, which partitions off a piece of itself and goes logs on to that new entity. And you can make as many of those as you want, unless the system runs out of bits, but it doesn't look like that's anywhere near likely to happen. And, and then after death, um, do you stay your IUOC or do you, re, do you ever join the LCS or how does that no, work? What works when you die, you're, you are aware here and then suddenly you're aware you're not here anymore. You're somewhere else, but at least you exist. You are, but you're not here. And somebody will come out and say something to you. Over here, everything's fine. We've been waiting for you. Congratulations, you won the lottery, you know, whatever. They, just, just to relax you and make you feel more at ease. And as soon as that happens, you start forgetting your past life, just like you forget dreams. You know, dreams fade with time. Yeah. They come up and right away they're clear and then five minutes later they're foggy and five minutes after that they're gone. Well, that's the way it is with your past life. That just starts to fade. And as that fading takes place, that partition between the, the uh, free will awareness unit and the IUOC is taken down. So you start to merge back and now it's just one individuated unit of consciousness, no partition anymore and you're beginning to forget that lifetime. And at that point, you decide what you're gonna do next. I'm skipping a lot of little steps, but hitting the high points, you, you decide what you're gonna do next. And then when you decide that IUC can, can uh, cut, you know, slice off a part of itself with a petition, and then that gets logged on to that new entity. So that's kind of the and you say that you like forget that, but do the lessons like stay within your yes. being? You forget all of the, the facts about it. Your memory goes, but the quality that you, have, uh, that you have grown up to that point stays. That is cumulative. That's the whole point of it. That's why you have to keep going around because that quality slowly builds with each experience. Great, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Did I do them all? Did, yeah. you, have, did you have another one? Um, <laughs> um, I, I thought you had three things there. Uh, no, I think um, the only other quick thing that, like, it wasn't there. One more quick thing. What about, like, um, they find, like, throughout Earth's history, like, I forget the name of it, but, like, um, things that aren't supposed to be here, you know, like, erratics. yes, erratics, like, you know, like the... the uh, Giants, but or like the antitherium mechanism, like an old computer, or like all of these old things that like aren't, or like the London hammer. It's a hammer from London, Texas. That that um, ancient artifacts that aren't supposed to be here. Like, is that like the system testing us in a way? Well, first of all, I would have to be more convinced that these artifacts do exist. No, that's just me. Okay. I'm yeah, skeptical totally. of everything. Uh -huh. And I think everybody should be skeptical of everything. So there's a whole lot of things that end up on the internet that aren't necessarily true. So one, I would be very skeptical because like I said, I'm just skeptical of everything. Yeah. Of whether or not they really exist or whether that's somebody having fun. Okay. Saying that for whatever the reason is. But let's, you know, let's do things that we know do exist like pictures on the wall of a cave of men with little bubbles around their head, you know, that look awful lot like spacesuits. Um, you know, big things down in South America that look like, uh, you know, they're, they're, you can see that there's certain geometry going on here, 
but you don't see it unless you're you know, 20,000 feet in the air because it's so big over so much area that from the ground it doesn't look like anything. Yeah. It's that large, you know. And where'd all that stuff come from? You know, we have things like that that we know are, that we know are facts. Uh, Danik and von Danik or somebody wrote a book about, yeah, uh, ab about that. And what are these things? Remember, we live in a virtual reality. So anything can be in a virtual reality that the system wants to put there. Now, if it puts that there just to wake us up, that's a possibility. Oh, look at this. Isn't this interesting? Spacemen on a cave wall. You know, oh, well, it's like, like a landing field. You know, it's just straight and it's long and it's got these lines down it. And, you know, it could just be put there just to stir the pot and let, make us see that there's something bigger just because it does those kind of things, trying to wake us up and get us to see bigger pictures. Uh, it could be that some other beings came here and had some interaction here and then left and aren't here anymore. That's a possibility. That runs a little bit into, into of a collision with uh, the Fermi paradox, but uh, eh, you know, sometimes things collide when we really don't understand them very much, so that's okay. Uh, any of those things might be true. You know, it's also possible that the, uh, you know, this big uh, simulation that was evolving didn't actually go to where the system needed it to go. It wasn't evolving anything that had the quality of choices that it needed for its IUSCs to log on to. You know, it's not that if you know, we only have chipmunks and snakes and lizards to log on to, then hardly anybody's going to learn a lot by logging on, at least at the human level. Most of the IUOCs aren't going to learn much from that. So it might have just come in and twiddled with what was going on there. You know, people do that when they make virtual realities. If they don't quite work the way they want them to, they go in and make a couple of changes you know, put things in there that aren't really part of the rule set, but it gets things going. That may have happened as well. Who knows? So we don't know about that. But the good news is it really doesn't matter either. Because whether those things with the bowls on their heads were really spacemen or whether that was halos because they were very intuitive people that saw, you know, the lights around people from the database, uh, who knows what that was, but it doesn't matter because what matters to us is what helps us grow up. And if it doesn't help you reduce your fear, if it doesn't help you get rid of your ego and your beliefs, then it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. You know, so inquiring egos want to know. One more question. Okay, only one more. One more last quick question. Only one more. Okay, hi Tom. More. Okay, so um, basically, yeah. every, everyone here has been talking about um, quality of consciousness and when we die. Um, it, what, what, I have, what I started calling it from being on your board was conservation of quality of consciousness. And that has it as when, when our character dies, our evolution of consciousness is at a certain point, and that's what, that's what our individu individuated union of consciousness keeps, it conserves. And then when, the, when it decides to come back as another character, it's going to have to grow in to that level of consciousness as an infant. And this is the part I really wanted to talk a little bit about, was as an infant, when we're born, we're receiving our stream of data, but we don't know what anything in that, any of that stream means. It doesn't have any meaning to us until we have enough experiences as an infant with a specific thing in that, in that stream of data, like a ball, to know what ball is and then when we start maturing we can we understand that there's all kinds of different balls and you know and so we can generalize it and then we own the concept ball and then when the stream of data does come in and has ball in it we have to interpret it per what we what the meaning what our all our experiences has made that mean to us right. so everybody in this room could see a ball and it's going to mean something different to every single one, and, and that's, I just wanted to mention that, that it's important to understand that when we're, when we're being raised, when we're infants and we don't have the meanings for the stimuli yet, our parents and anyone else around us are very important as to what these, the stimuli is going to end up meaning to us by how they react to it. Yes, 
That brought up another point, okay. uh, Betha, that, that I'd also like to mention, that you touched on. Everything you said was exactly right. It does work that way. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, uh, that you maintain this quality of consciousness when you come back. But what I didn't mention is that when you're born, as you said, you not only don't know the, a ball from, you know, from your mother, you don't know anything until you, you get that information. But another thing you are when you are very young is self-centered. Young people are self-centered. It's just natural when you're two or three or four or five years old, you are at the center of your own universe and there's everything out there that's a little scary. And then you have your parents who take care of you, but it's all about you. So we start off here very self-centered. So we grow up, we get less self-centered and less self-centered. We die, we have a quality of consciousness. We come back at that quality of consciousness as a child who is very self-centered. So you have to then make good choices as a child. You know, we talked about the old soul idea. You make better choices more often and you, you tend to outgrow that self-centeredness quickly. So instead of taking until you're 60 years old to finally you know, get rid of your, your self-centeredness, you may get rid of your self-centeredness by the time you're six or by the time you're 12. And you become, you know, that's because you've been around. So you have to earn it back in a sense, but you usually do very quickly because you've been there and you've done that and you understand. So, but you do, you don't just come back you know, a grand wizard or something, you come back as a child, you come back self-centered, it's all about you, but quicker than people who are not very well grown last time. You know, they struggle for long times, maybe all their lives, maybe all the next hundred lives, they struggle with that. But after you've been around and you've earned that, you still have to start there, but you work your way through all of that very quickly. And we probably all know of children who are three and four and five years old who show an amazing amount of caring and empathy and connection. And we know others who show none of that. You know, it's me, 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 it's mine, you know. You get a lot of that as well. But in the beginning, that's a mixed bag. There's a lot of me, 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 and mine, along with regaining the quality that you've earned before. So the, the childhood thing is a real mixed bag of, of uh, experience. So I didn't mention that before, and then Vanessa came up and said, well, didn't you tell me that you have to earn that back? And I said, well, yes, I didn't mention that. But, so that's the, whole, that's the whole story. But you get it back quickly. Yeah, you get it back very quickly. So it's almost mathematical conservation of quality. Yeah, it, consciousness is and serve. But now, you do have the ability of while you're quickly earning your way back to that same understanding, which requires you to develop language and concepts and other things, it's going to take a while to do. While you're doing that, it's possible that you could make some really bad choices and then start to de-evolve. Still, all your choices add up to what's going on, you see. So, it's possible you could go the other way. There's no guarantee you're going to capitalize on that, but your probability is that you will. The biggest probability is that you pretty quickly will get back to where you were. So that's why you have some people who are, uh, you know, they come back here, they're kids, uh, they don't care much about anything but themselves, they run around, they have fun, they go to parties, they do all this kind of stuff, and sometime in their, uh, you know, late 30s or 40s, bam, you know, life hits them, and suddenly they get a bigger picture, suddenly things make sense, they get serious, they care, they end up with empathy, and the whole lifestyle and whole attitude just turns on a dime, or maybe a dime that only lasts for two or three years, you know, that turns very quickly. And that's because they've already earned that, and they were just taking a little time to figure it back out again. So is that, have we reached the end point? Well then, let me say, guys, you've been a wonderful audience. I've enjoyed being here. I always have fun at these events. This is 
this is what I do, this is what makes me happy. So uh, you guys have made me happy by being here and by uh, asking such great questions. You're a lovely audience and I want to thank all of you for taking the trouble and the time to come here. Thank you. Thank you.